Wilkinson here. Thanks for joining us again today. It would really help me a lot if you did a couple things, if you're enjoying these episodes. First of all, hit that subscribe button below. It really helps me out. Secondly, if you are enjoying the podcast, hit that like button. That's a little thumbs up down there. Leave a comment. Let me know which episodes you like, and I'll try to do more like that. Thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Greetings, Wilkinson here. I am back today for a part two with Kevin, and he's the one that went back and forth on the bus jillions of times. <laughs> anyway, the, when we stopped the last time we chatted, you were back in Boston, I think, right? Yeah. I but I was just thinking, that, you know, that that's a lot of trips back and forth across the country. Any highlights that, that we missed uh, before we go back to Boston? What, what else happened? There was a lot of interesting things that happened on the bus. But one thing that sticks out in my mind is when I was going back to Arizona the first time after my grandfather had passed away, okay, switching buses in the Port Authority in Manhattan, and because um, Manhattan's like a stop going from Boston, from right? Boston, okay, Manhattan okay. is the first okay. large stop right. where you switch buses. I didn't have any glasses. I need glasses to see. I needed glasses since I was in the fifth grade. And but you didn't have any. I didn't have them at this point because I didn't have any money and I didn't have any way of getting glasses. So I squinted my way through most of life at this point. You know? <laughs> wow. So I didn't realize that I was checking out a man as he was walking across the street. I didn't realize that I was like staring at him and squinting at him as, as he was coming across the street and he came up to me. Wait, well, you, it's understandable because you didn't do gay 101, right? Right. Okay. Still learning how to be a gay man at this point, you know? All right. And he comes up to me and he, he says, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to my place and smoke a joint if you want to come. And I said, sure. You know, so we got in a cab and went back to his place. And it was this interesting New York loft in the meatpacking district. You know, he had a shower that was in a closet in his kitchen. He had a bathtub in his kitchen. <laughs> uh, very interesting, you know, all this art. And he has this pornography he's playing on the television and he's trying to like get me in the mood. And... We end up smoking pot, we end up having sex, and it's over, and he gives me, and it was really good, because, you know, I'm unexperienced, so anything right. is going to be really good. Right. And he gives me $40. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is not, you know, I said, I'm not, this is not why I came. He's like, I know, I know, but it'll help you on your trip, he said. It'll help you on your trip. So uh, I took the money, got in a cab, got back to Port Authority, realized I left my bus ticket there. Oh, no. So used the 20 of the 40 to get back and forth from the meatpacking district back to the Port Authority. So he was still there and you retrieved your ticket? Yeah, I retrieved okay, my ticket. Good. He asked me to stay. He said, do you want to stay and live here with me? And You must have made quite an impression on him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, be my assistant, you know, and have sex with me and, and all that. And... um that would have been an interesting life, I'm sure, but it's not what I chose to do. <laughs> so, like, It's so interesting as you're telling this story, because you always have these points where it's a fork in the road. Yes. And that could have been another fork in the road. Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and I think about those things like, wow, how would my life be different right. had I chosen to stay in New York at that point? I would probably be dead. That's the, the conclusion I come to, that I, I wasn't supposed to do that. I you think know? you've said that a couple times now. Yeah. At that so point in my is, life, you I was... Let you, you ended the last episode we did that time with, you know, someone's watching over you or there's some guidance there yeah and so that this is just another example of that's, that that's how i feel exactly yeah that okay. um even though it sounded like a great idea something inside <laughs> me told me no you know but i kept the man's card in my wallet for a very long time how old was he do you think i think he was in his 40s okay and you were in your early I, 20s i was 20 yeah okay. 21 maybe 20 okay. so you know not too out of the ordinary well that's but. an interesting little aside yeah all right that so let's uh let's get you back to boston back to boston the last episode when we when we chatted so yeah. you arrived back in boston yeah then then what you know i was just working in a restaurant i met a friend who owned this restaurant and you know we became friends and um i met these other people and i was i went to school to be a piano tuner and a rebuilder of pianos where'd that come from <laughs> 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 That's a little off the wall. Yeah, Whoa. I've always been a musical person. <laughs> okay. And I wanted to still be around music, but I didn't want to perform. That's so why I thought maybe at least being a, a piano tuner would keep me around pianos, you know. Right. I went to school. I hated it. It was very boring. I, you know, I had ADD. I was anxious. I was I was a mess when I was a kid. I, I couldn't focus to save my life. So to end a program 
I, end, I did end up working in the field a little bit later on in life. So you went to school for that. Yeah. How did you get, where'd you get the money for that? Uh, my parents they and did. loans, loans and my parents. Yeah. My parents paid, which was good. I think they felt guilty. I don't know. Well, they should. Yeah. <laughs> we heard the story. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Don't shit all over yourself. That's what all right. So talking. they, uh, so the piano tuning didn't really work out. Yeah, it didn't really work out. Okay. I, so I started dealing drugs. I met. I, I started selling pot. I met someone in that class that was selling pot, and he. I was started selling pot for him. I was selling pot. I was a bicycle messenger. And I met up with this group of people that like, yeah, we're going to buy a bus and take a bus across the country. It was Y2K, remember? So like, oh, Y2K, Y2K, we're all going to die. Um, so why not go out with a bang? We felt right. So we bought a bus and turned into an RV and drove that across the country for a year. That was interesting. <laughs> that's another story. I mean, that's a completely different story, but uh, we can come back we'll to that another time. have to be back for that yeah, one. Yeah, let's talk about that another time. When we got back from the bus and, you know, here I am again. And I decided to become a hairdresser. Where are you in the country at this point? Boston. You're I got back, back to Boston. Boston. I always went back to Boston. All right. So that's yeah. your hub. Yeah. Boston was the, the hub of the universe. They like to, okay, all right. to call themselves so you're Boston. back in Boston. Yeah. And decided to be a hairdresser. I decided to go to hairdressing school. I read a book called Running with Scissors. And I related a lot to the character, you know, the man who wrote the book. And for some reason, I thought that he became a hairdresser. But he didn't. I had read the book subsequently. And I don't think he did become a hairdresser. Or maybe he did. Anyways, that was where I got the idea to, to become a hairdresser. So I went to hairdressing school and became a hairdresser in Boston. And I was like making good money. I was an apprentice and I was working in these very fancy salons. I started working in this other salon where I started dating my manager and we started doing cocaine. And because I, I hated it, I hated doing hair. I'm not the type of person that can sit there and talk to you about mindless things for an hour over and over again all day. And so I felt like I needed drugs to like keep me interested in people or keep me talking right. all day you know because at this point in my life i still felt like like drugs were a solution to my problems but that ended up crashing and burning he got fired for dating his employees and i wasn't the only one and uh, we ended up moving to western massachusetts you and the guy yeah okay and we moved to the berkshires and i got a job at a place called Kurpalu center for yoga and health and got into yoga and started on this journey of this yoga lifestyle. And I met a man there and we started dating. You weren't dating the former manager guy anymore? Uh, no. Or did you like have both of them at the same time? No, uh, not at that point, no. <laughs> but um, the, the manager was uh, seeing other people behind my back. Well, I didn't know about it. And someone that worked at the center knew and told me and showed me the ads he had been placing online. Oh. And so I went home and I told him about it. We were living together. I didn't have anything at this point as well. I still have nothing great. Everything I had was because of him. And I left. I left him. And I, I stayed at the Kripalu Center for a month because I was friendly with people there. And they, they let me stay. It's a retreat center. So they let me stay in the rooms that weren't being used, you know, until I could get on my feet. I started dating this other guy. This other guy and uh, that was a two-year relationship of craziness and all that. But anyways, we broke up. I'm back in Boston. And he sends me an email that's saying um, I'm HIV positive. So, this is the two year relationship. The two year guy. relationship okay. guy. His name is Roger. Okay. And uh, Roger sent me an email saying that I'm HIV positive, and I fainted. And I you literally I, fainted. I literally fainted. I stood up, and the room got dark, and I I woke up on the ground. You know. Had you been testing yourself regularly up to that point or not? Up to that point, no. Okay. No, because I I didn't feel like I was all that promiscuous right at that point, you know, and uh, so I I had uh, I had started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings by this point, and so I was three months sober at this time, and I went to a meeting that night, and the, the night of the day you found out the day that he the, told you, me that you got the email. Yeah, okay. he sent me the email in the afternoon. It was too okay. late to go get a test. Okay, so I went to a meeting and I talked about it. And the next day, a friend of mine from meetings came with me to get tested. And uh, sure enough, it happened to be that I was positive as well. And my life changed instantly. Like, I, I became a different person. And that, that sounds strong. Like, I, I didn't become a different person altogether. But all of a sudden, I felt like something else took over. And my drive was different. My, my whatever I had been trying to please in the past, like... You know, I've always been, when you get kicked out of the house when you're young, you're always trying to get back into the house 
you're always trying to get acceptance and I don't know, welcoming, welcoming from the people that booted you out, you know, especially your parents. Right. And that was a big driving factor in my life at that point was, was them like trying to make them happy. And like all of a sudden that note, that didn't matter. And it was just about me. And I've seen people become positive and they go the opposite direction. They start doing drugs and they throw, you know, like whatever, I'm going to die. And for me, it was different. And I finally became like, I don't know, something crystallized. And so kind of what I'm hearing is you're saying instead of, oh, well, I'm, I'm just going to let it all go and go have fun blah 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 like some people you just mentioned you're saying i have a purpose i i want to live yeah basically yeah Yeah. there's something that i'm supposed to be you know i i don't want to die i have been looking for a self-destruct button in my whole life and all of a sudden i was presented with one and it seemed like it was not the thing that i wanted to do i was homeless at the time i was living in the woods in jamaica plain which is a neighborhood of boston so Um, you're back in the woods again and back in the woods again yes trying to save money so i get an apartment i was working in a candle factory making candles i started living this you know i got really involved with the with meetings started going to meetings all the time um i got a job working for this older couple as their butler sort of and um one so of them this is started like a wealthy meeting, boston couple or yeah something like wealthy that. boston okay. a gay a, a, a older gay wealthy boston boston couple okay and they were in their six late early 70s and one of them started needing more assistance, taking showers, going to the bathroom, changing their clothes. He had all sorts of health issues. And so I started helping him out with those things. And we went to France for two months in the summer. Well, not two months, one month, twice in the summer. Okay. We went to Puerto Rico. We, I was their assistant, basically. And then I decided to go to nursing school because Frank was the gentleman who needed more help. And uh, yeah, I went to nursing school and became a nurse. They died. They uh, both died. Yeah. Well, one of them died. The other one lived a little bit longer, but I was no longer working with them. I had to become a nurse at this, you know, well, I hadn't become a nurse yet. I, I worked with two other very influential men from Boston. I was working with a man named Daniel Fetterman, who was the dean of medical students at Harvard, and another guy named Marvin Minsky, who was the father of AI, they say. You know, he was a big guy at, over at MIT. Wow. Those men have since died. Were you helping care for them or what? Yeah, I was helping care for them, yeah. Dan had dementia, but not too badly, and he just needed help paying his bills and stuff. So did you find something? I mean, you've gone to a lot of schools, plus the School of Hard Knocks. Yeah. So were you, was your heart in the nursing then? Was that oh, something completely. you really wanted to do then? Yes, yes. So you finally found your place then? Yeah. You know, uh, it just felt natural for me. I've always okay. felt the need to help people, the okay. desire to help people. It's why I feel like I'm on the planet. You know, I will help people. I'm prone to helping people more than I could help myself. You know, it's okay. easier to like help other people than to help yourself, you know. Wow. But nursing gave me that uh, outlet kind of to be of assistance to other people and still get paid at the same time, you know, which was good. Right. So that started my career in nursing, you know, and currently I work a little in the emergency psychiatric room in Manhattan and just kind of take care of, you know, the people that they pull off the street that are having psychiatric breakdowns. Um, and that's where I excel, dealing with people in crisis well, situations. Have, I think your background probably really helped, right? Do oh, you yeah. understanding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very yeah. much. I mean, when you travel, you're exposed to a lot of different places and it expands your mind, you know, and expands your capacity for knowledge, I believe. And so just dealing with different people and now, you know, it's still becoming more and more clear to me, but how my whole past has just shaped where I am to be today. You know, right. it all makes sense. You know, things just kind of like fit into place. Situations that I had to go through to get past the shyness, say, to feel more like I had agency in my life. All those, you know, like the HIV thing, the HIV diagnosis gave me so much agency that I didn't realize I had before. And so when I tell people, oh, I'm HIV positive, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And they don't Uh, understand that, you know, they don't understand what that means. So that was another fork, actually. I'm thinking about all this. Yeah. I, I see things in pictures a lot. But when I, when you're describing that, it's like you're at this other fork. You could just basically let yourself go and have fun and kill yourself right. when you found out. Yep. Or there's the other path. And I'm picturing you like being propelled down that path. Yeah. it was. That's what it feels like. It to was me. a propulsion. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I was heavily involved in the uh, sober community in Boston. A great group of people, you know, just going to school really having a goal and it it really it really helped me 
So how long have you been doing the nursing stuff now? Seven years. Seven years. Yep. Okay. And it's been, and that was a difficult transition for me, you know, to go from being living in the woods to now being a professional. Right. In a professional setting, I got fired from my first nursing job. You know, I just, did, I didn't know how to like talk to people or present myself in a professional way. Uh, you know, I was just a mess. Um, so <laughs> I got fired from my first nursing wow. job, but it was, you know, I learned something right. and, and you've learned subsequently. So and now I'm, I'm great. Um, I'm great. No, I don't mean I'm to be so egotistical, <laughs> but you know, I'm good at what I do. You're on track. I'm on track. They call right. me the patient whisperer, you know, really? they, yes. Like oh, I, cool. I'm good with people in crisis situations, huh. you know, and I know how to remain calm and, and talk to them in a way that's going to get them to be calm. And, and you live in New York. Yep. I live in Queens with my husband. And you have a husband now. Yes. Richard we mentioned and I, him on the last episode. What's his name? His name's Richard. Okay. He's an artist. And where did you meet? Uh, we met at the Miami Roundup, which is a convention of sober gay men in uh, 2010. Okay. 2010. Was it love at first sight or did uh, it Yeah, it sort of. of sort of gradually... it was. <laughs> no, I mean, we. I didn't know I was going to see him again after the Roundup, but he gave me his number and there was something about him. I'm like, I like this guy, you know, like, like not only that, but I felt that I was the person for this guy, you know, like that we were meant to be together. For whatever reason, you know, we had come together and after that point, we said goodbye in Miami. I didn't think I, maybe I'd see him again if I had went to, because he lived in New York and I lived in Boston. And I thought, well, that's not too far. Come on. No, we're not right. <laughs> my plane was diverted from JFK to Newark on my way home and I was going to miss my connection to Boston from Florida. Okay. So I called him up and I... Landed in Wait, Newark. this is on the way back from Florida? Back from Florida, after we had met. Okay. We said goodbye. I, we, he gave me his phone number. And, and you said hello. <laughs> I said hello. The next day, I'm like, hey, by the way, my plane is being diverted to Newark. I will miss my connection in Queens, you know, at LaGuardia or JFK, wherever it was. I was supposed to be flying to Boston. You know, do you want to hang out? So I went to his house. And he's like, yeah, Newark is uh, just like a Boston. He Just like a New York airport, he said. So you can come to see me. And I took the train to his house. And... Uh, we took the Fenghua bus back and forth, the Chinese bus, $15 for two years um, really? on the weekends. Yeah. And then I got into a more extensive part of my nursing school and I wasn't going to be able to keep going back and forth, you know, so he came to Boston and lived with me in Boston while I finished school. And we've been together ever since. And then when did you move to, you said you're in Queens? Yeah. Uh, well, we moved to Illinois first. After I got out of high school, after I got oh out, of, out of college, uh, be, when I became a nurse, we moved to Illinois. A friend of Why? mine, a friend of ours was uh, getting his fellowship. He did a fellowship in uh, epilepsy at Harvard, and he got this big job over at the hospital in Illinois, a small town called Champaign-Urbana. I've heard of it. Yeah, th big college town. Right. Um, so we lived there for two years while I became a nurse. In Boston, I only had an associate's degree at the time. You could only work in a nursing home if you only had an associate's degree. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to work in a hospital. Right. So these, this place would hire me with an associate's degree. So we made the, the trip to the middle of the country and lived in Illinois for two years. Then uh, Richard's family, his father had some health problems. And he's from Western New York originally. And so we ended up moving to Buffalo to be around his family. My hometown. Yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. So we bought this huge broken down house on the east side of Buffalo. And if you know what Buffalo, you what know. street? Uh, Laurel Street, Laurel and Jefferson. So we lived on. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's the, the reaction we got all that's the time. That's kind of like the hood, isn't it? It, it yeah. definitely is the heart of the hood. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we bought this huge house with the intention of like fixing it up, you know, and living in this great house. It had a, we loved to garden. So it had really great spaces for gardens. But it was in the middle of the hood and we felt stuck there because we put this money into this house and we didn't realize in what disrepair it was in, you know. And so we just kind of like, so like just money plummeted. Pit. Yeah, it was yeah. just a money pit. A man, uh, Buffalo was being repopulated by the Bengali people. A lot of Bengalis, b people from Bangladesh are moving from New York City to Buffalo. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because it's so inexpensive to live there. You know, so, so you said, hey, I got a deal. <laughs> well, the guy moved across the street from us, and immediately I knew that he wanted to buy our house. You know, I just got that feeling. And a, a year or so went by, and he came over to the house, and I showed him inside. 
and the deal was done. Like, it, well, it took two more years, but he told us he's going to buy the house. And so they bought the house and they're, they're turning it into a masjid, which is a, like a, a smaller mosque like a smaller kind of community center. Oh, really? Yeah. So it was a big house then. 3,000 square feet. Yeah, it was huge. And that didn't include the uh, basement and the attic. It was just a huge house. So you sold that, and then where'd you go? We went to Queens. So right to Queens. And that's where we are today. Uh, We've been there about a year. How do you like it? Uh, I like it. Anything you could ever possibly want to do is there in abundance you know um there's lots of restaurants and lots of men <laughs> there's lots of uh, bakeries you know it's just new york is set up for people to live there right you know so, so i have a question so is the gypsy blood in you and i mean do you strongly, feel like can you settle down in queens i have or? a really difficult time settling down right yeah so you get the itch still yes Yes. And what does Rich do about that? Uh, he just slaps you or what? He's been great. He understands me, I believe, you know, and I think that uh, he's kind of along for the ride in a way, you know, but it's it, probably a bumpy, but fun we're together, ride, right? We're, we're, we're together. Like, uh, yeah. he really helps me be more grounded and centered. And I think I help him kind of get out of his comfort zone a little bit. So we're good for each other like that. Right. He was all about moving to Illinois. He was all about moving to Buffalo. He was all about moving to Queens. And uh, we'll see what's going to happen next. But I don't think we're going to stay in Queens. It's a you it's don't? a lot. Yeah. It's a it's a it's very um It's probably expensive, isn't it? <laughs> or not. We moved to uh we moved to New York right as the inflation was happening. Oh boy. You know this past <laughs> run of inflation, so right. yeah, so it was like double double expensive you know like wow. moving from buffalo which is very inexpensive where our mortgage for our three thousand square foot house was less than six hundred dollars a month what yeah huh? to now you know our rent is like close to four thousand dollars a month so yikes i mean luckily i'm making a good salary and he's making a good salary so we can afford it you should move to palm springs i think i'll throw my vote in for you two there yes well, well that's why we <laughs> one of the reasons why we came to palm springs oh, seriously yes yeah, to like oh wow view our future kind of goals you have to get used to the heat but it's pretty cool here yeah 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 it seems you guys would be if you came here you'd be traveling around in the summer and you wouldn't be here anyway yeah (laughs) you'd think of something right uh luckily i have a profession which allows me to do that yeah you know while with the mature population here there's a lot of nursing stuff so yeah Yeah. i do i do best working one-on-one with people you know and so to be that sort of like an artist yep he's a painter he He, uh, he is uh Mixed media, painting, collage. He okay. makes beautiful tie-dye t-shirts. He's just, uh, you know, he comes from a artistic... His mother was very artistic. Okay. You know, and his father was brilliant. So the two of them together, uh, he makes him a brilliant a brilliant artist. Are his parents around? Both of his parents have passed now. They Did were you older. ever meet them? Yes. I you was did. fortunate enough to meet them. Okay. Um, when I first met Richard, he was not, in, he was not out of the closet. Oh, to his family. And so I I never thought that I would see them. I never thought I would meet his family. You know, Uh, he did. He did come out to them. And I got a chance to meet his mom before she passed. And I met his dad and formed a relationship with his father before he passed. And so I I, I know his brother and his sister-in-law. So, you know, I feel fortunate too. And your parents have met him? Yes, my parents know him. Uh, They met him. They like him. They are. They love him as my mother loves him, you know, as a son. My father tolerates the fact that I am with a man, <laughs> but no, he yeah he's accepted. He's been accepted in my family, which is good. My brothers, my brothers know him and love him. And well, I would think with your dad, you know, as a teacher, that he'd be a little bit more open minded. But I guess people are where they are. Yeah, my my father is a uh, you know through no fault of his own was raised in in a culture that condemns homosexuality right and supports was that a religious thing or what or just no no you know they were not practicing catholics i think that just the machismo gotcha. attitude that right was formed in this country after world war ii you know right. and he was kind of a, a victim of that as his father was huh. you know his father's father died in the spanish flu in oh. 1919 Okay. And so my grandfather was raised without a father. So he raised my father not really knowing what he was doing, you know, like he didn't have a role model. So my father, I give him the credit, you know, like he, he was raised in this environment. He's the 
he's a product of that sort of, uh, I can't hold it against him. You know what I mean? I had my own internal homophobia. I know what that's like, you know? So I try not to hold it against him, I guess. What do you like about Rich? What do I like about Rich? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, A lot of things. I mean, he's so creative, plays the piano beautifully. He's quiet. You know, I like that. You're the talker. He's the quiet one. Yes. And I've become a lot more the quiet one since we've met. I've taken on his kind of like his persona in a way that now, you know, I always rag on him because he sometimes he's too quiet, you know, and I'll be talking and talking and talking. I'm waiting for a response from him, like just talking and talking and talking. And I just keep going on because he's not saying anything back to me. Right. Um, I've become that person <laughs> now, now that now that it's just, you know, quieter, you know, and yeah, more relaxed and chill. But, We've had quite a life. Yeah, it's just scraping the surface, really. Wow. Um, yeah. Very hopefully interesting I'm gonna, stories. I'm going to get it all down. Like, well, hopefully you'll move here and I'll hear more of them. Yeah. And I, I want to see some of Rich's art, too. Yeah. Thanks for coming in again. Great to see you it again. Great. Thank you so much. It was great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.